today my guest is Jim Brogan. Jim is uh, the founder and president and chief investment officer at Brogan Financial. I think he, he does a few more things um, as well, but those are those are at least those those are three of three of his hats. Uh, Jim's a, a longtime friend of uh, the finance department. Uh, we've been we've been talking about various things uh, about our field, and uh, he, he visits with students on a regular basis. And so, uh, Jim, thanks so much for coming to talk with us today. Could you tell us a little bit about just just basically what what you all do at at Brogan Financial? Sure. Yeah. And thanks for having me on, Eric. It's it's great to be here anytime I can visit yeah. with students. Um, so Brogan Financial, you know, we're an independent boutique investment advisory firm that does investment management and comprehensive financial planning. Now, that's a mouthful. What all does that mean? That means we're an independent advisory firm. So we're not connected to a big company like Merrill Lynch or Morgan Stanley or anybody like that. We're our own company. We're registered with the SEC directly. And then we do everything. We, we manage portfolios all in-house and we do financial planning. So now our niche right now, our focus up till now has been people 55 years and old, old and up. I mean, it's kind of people that are starting to think about the transition into retirement or people who are already retired. Uh, and we have four advisors here, including me. And one thing that is unique about us is that we all do the same thing. You know, we don't have each advisor kind of going off and doing their own thing like you see at most firms. We do what we do. And, and ultimately, I want the voice to be my voice in terms of what we do. Now, there's four different personalities, and four heads are certainly better than one. But ultimately, I make the final decision, and I want it to be my voice. So I want all of our clients to get the same experience, the same expertise, the same level of everything. So that's somewhat a little bit unique here in that we don't have all of our advisors kind of doing their own thing. Uh, we are going to start dipping down. We're looking at a few initiatives over the next year or two to dip down and start having a focused effort to serve people under age 55. We do have currently clients that are under 55, but they it's happened completely organically. It's either family members or friends, or more often than not, it's children of existing clients that want to engage us. So then uh, your, your, your typical client then, we're, we're, talking, we're talking basically about households, right? Not, not firms with retirement plans. We're talking about right. individual we currently, households. We currently plans. serve individual consumers, so households. Okay. And so then there's the, uh, of course, there's the, the, the retirement slice, which is a huge huge, huge, huge component to, to anyone's financial plan. Um, but you also, you also focus on some other dimensions, I, 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 I presume. So, so what, aside from financial planning, what other dimensions kind of bleed into what you do? Well, so, um, you know, we, we manage our clients' investments. Uh, we help them a lot with income planning, which would include uh, social security election strategies, and then how do they structure their investments to support income? Because when you get, when you transition into retirement, uh, it's no longer about how much money you have. It's how you take what you have and convert it into stable income that you can depend on that you don't outlive your income. You don't run out of money. So it's about stable income that can increase over time because of inflation. And there's a different set of challenges and stresses uh, for a retiree than a younger person, because instead of saving and accumulating money, they're going to actually be withdrawing and spending money. So it brings on extra risks that you don't face when you're younger. And so that's the niche we focus on. Um, we work with younger folks, but we, we, you know, if they fit the model of what we do, which is take tried and proven formulas for success. So we're not going to day trade or short term time the market. We are going to take advantage of opportunities, but we're not being super aggressive in things like timing. Now, on other things we do so that the reason I'm mentioning all that, Eric, is because the income planning is so critically important in a, in a financial plan for somebody who's getting near retirement. But then we also do, you know, we help coordinate their tax planning, you know, income taxes, are the largest expense you and I will ever have in our lifetimes. And it's really not even close. You know, when I ask that people, that question of people, what's the largest expense you'll ever have in your lifetime? I usually hear either uh, their house, their mortgage, or 
health care. But the reality is neither of those uh, even compares to our tax costs. And so and we have a significant threat today of having a radically different tax system in place 10 years from now because of our budget mm-hmm. deficits and our federal debt and, and unfunded liabilities. Mm-hmm. So Mm -hmm. uh, tax planning is critically important. And that's not what we do this time of year. That's tax preparation, which is looking in the rearview mirror. Tax planning is a forward-looking exercise and being intentional about the taxes we pay now and the taxes we pay later. Then there's estate planning, putting all of those pieces together legally and protecting people while they're alive and protecting their families when they're gone, making sure everything's handled properly. Certainly health care planning is very, very important as people mm-hmm. age. Now, those are really the comprehensive parts of financial planning. So we just coordinate all that, and make sure it all fits together. We're not attorneys. We don't do legal documents. I'm not a CPA. We don't prepare tax returns, but we do coordinate everything and look to the future. Um, so, uh, there's, uh, just from, from, from chatting with you, um, over the years, I know that there's a, there's a side of your business that is very much, uh, sort of dealing with the numbers, um, the strategy, the implementation. Um, so there's sort of that side. And then there's also the side that's very relational that has a, a huge, um, education, uh, component to it. And so, to, to segue, I, I want to talk about both of those uh, for a bit, because I, I know that many of the, the students that will watch this are, are thinking about these, these various paths that they could go on. Uh, but, but to segue into that, um, I, I, I have to put up um, a, a, a test question um, that, that, that I might give to one of I hope, my I hope I don't intro finance watching this are um, in finance 306 which is th- this is our this is their first real academic exposure to finance and so um, we're, we're talking about things in class like how, how to basically calculate present values and future values of things like annuities and so one of the classic uh, simplified problems that we we, we look at is is, is the, the the retirement problem and so it's about this guy named Justin so Justin uh, is turning 30 today and he's making this plan for retirement and he's gonna save five thousand dollars a year every year um, in some some account until he turns 70 and um, the, the the students are just asked to do a, the basic calculation of well hey if 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 the investments in the account earn eight percent per year, how much money is Justin going to have in the pot um, when he turns 70? And so this is, and I know that um, what you ultimately do with financial planning um, has many, many, many layers um, to it, but sort of at its core, um, this is kind of the, the, the type of calculation that's, uh, that, that's, that's, that, that's running through that. And so Start with that, and, and 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 could you tell us a little bit about what you do on the on the research side, on the numbers side, to maybe get to some of the numbers in a problem like this, and and some of the 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 the, the issues that come up when you're actually trying to implement um, a strategy like this. Yeah, that, those are all great questions. So uh, I'm going to start big picture, to Eric, and kind of thirty thousand foot view because I think that's where when when we work with clients, that's where we always start. So you know, we have people that that only want to understand things at a 30,000 foot view. And then we have people that want a lot of detail. We'll have quantitative types, engineers, they want data. So I can go as deep as I, as they need me to, but let's start big picture. When I see this scenario, there are a lot of things that pop into my mind. Um, And the number one thing that pops into my mind is when we see the answer here, let's just call that for ease and simplicity. Let's just round that up and call that $1.3 million. Well, $1.3 million in 40 years is not going to be worth anywhere near what $1.3 million is worth today. So you need to, to really understand for a young person how much they've saved or how much they can anticipate saving using some assumptions that you've used here. We'll talk about those two. Uh, we really need to discount that based on an inflation rate. I would probably use two and a half percent. So then I would take that number and discount it at a two and a half percent rate and then see what that's actually worth in today's dollars. Uh, another way you could figure is, well, at an eight percent average return over time, in real in real return, if inflation is two and a half, the real return there really is five and a half. 
In other words, how much am I earning over and above cost of living increases? You're not really making eight, you're making five and a half. And I think it's important for young people to actually think in those kind of terms. You know, when we invest, we invest to beat inflation ultimately over time so that we can then have more money in the future than we have now. We want it to grow. If it doesn't beat inflation, it hadn't done anything. If inflation's 3% and I make 3%, I haven't gotten ahead. I, I didn't earn anything saving that money. You know, I didn't earn a, a, a premium over inflation. So that's the first thing that jumps out at me. Uh, the other thing is, or another thing is, what about this 8% return? Now, the way <laughs> you've put that in there is eight return, 8% return, return each year. Well, you know, we, we all know that doesn't work that way. Um, if it's an 8% average return over the 40 years, that's a reasonable assumption. Uh, but mm -hmm. we don't just click along making 8% every single year. So it's important to understand that fundamental reality of investments. We're going to have bear markets. We're going to have bull markets. When you're saving money, you just need it to average out in the end. Now, when you get into yep. retirement, that completely changes. There's a new risk we inherit when we retire, and it's called sequence of return risk. I like to call it bad market timing risk. You know, if you're, you're no longer saving and accumulating money, you're now withdrawing money. So if you have a big loss in the early years of retirement, and you're taking money out, you're going to come, if you don't have the right kind of plan in place, you're going to compound those losses. Yeah. And those, it, it's a yeah. completely, in other words, when are the good years and when are the bad years becomes a completely new risk that you start to inherit when you get closer to retirement. Now, I do want to touch yes. though on the 8% average return. The reality is most investors don't get that. And we have to look at the drags on that return as well. Like, what about income taxes? What about capital gains taxes? Is that really worth 1.3 million in future dollars? Have the taxes been accounted mm -hmm. for? And what are those taxes? Mm -hmm. You know, when we invest as we go, if it's not in a retirement account, there is a drag on that investment. It's called a tax drag because every year, you know, let's say you got mutual yep. funds. They have capital gain distributions every year in December. You have to pay taxes on that. If it's in a retirement account, yep. you don't have to do that. So you don't have that tax drag. You do have tax at the end if it's a traditional 401k or IRA, but there's a tax drag. There's also expenses and fees. What kind of drag is that going to have? Uh, there's behavioral problems, which is a huge issue. I know there was a study, and I probably should be able to reference it, Eric, but I can't in terms of who it was. But it was a couple of years ago, maybe two, two three years ago, and it looked at the prior 30 years, and it looked at the average returns in this, in this, in this U.S. stock market, S&P 500. And it was like 9 9.5% was the average return over that 30-year period, the average annualized return. But the average investor had made 2 to 3% annualized. The average investor didn't make 9%. Why? Because they were getting in and out at the wrong times. And th that's a big issue is our behavioral connection to what we're doing and understanding. Trying to chase hot investments or trying to time returns can be very, very dangerous. Doesn't mean it never works, yeah. but it doesn't work consistently yeah. over time. I think to, the, to, to an intro to finance student, um, being able to look at a problem like this and getting to the answer to the correct number feels like an accomplishment. And in some sense, it, it is. But as folks are launching into uh, finance type careers, I think it's important um, for us all to recognize that taking a problem, a simplified problem like this, getting to a number is actually more of a starting point. Well, so let's touch on that practically. Like what does that $1.3 million really mean and represent? You know, I've mentioned, you know, the future value of that, the cost of living uh, inflationary uh, uh, issue, but yeah. you know, really in retirement, you're going to need to take that money and you're going to need to convert it to income. And so how are you going to do that? And then how much income are you going to need? You know, I know there's some people say I'll have clients all the time, prospective clients 
especially younger folks. They might be 40 or 45 and they say, Jim, I've heard I need a million dollars to be able to retire. Well, I mean, that's kind of silly. I, I mean, I don't know how much somebody will need to retire on the surface. Mm-hmm. One person might need $800,000 yeah. today and another person may need $3 million. What does your other income look like? Mm-hmm. What's your social security benefit? Do you have rental property? What are your What is your yeah. lifestyle? How much money are you spending? So it's not just how mm-hmm. much you have, it's mm-hmm. how much you're spending and what your other income sources are. But then ultimately, whatever your income sources are in retirement, let's say it's only Social Security or, or maybe you have a rental property. But then you need more income than that. Well, then you're, you're in, you've got a gap in your needs that you're going to need to position your investments to provide for that gap. So it's all about, I'm a big believer, Eric, that when we do planning, whether it's just investments or comprehensive financial planning, we invest for an, to give us a, an outcome that we want. You know, it's easy to say, I just want to make the most money that I can make. Well, the problem is you have to take risks to make that happen. And investing is all about balancing risk and reward. Nobody wants to lose money, mm-hmm. but we all want to make money. So what is the plan that's going to give you the greatest likelihood of achieving your outcome? Okay. And then that's what we need to do. So we always want to focus on what is it you're trying to achieve with your money? Mm -hmm. Then we're going to get a plan. Mm -hmm. And that's where the research comes in. Then we're going to get a plan in place in terms of investments, tax planning, income planning, all of these things that I've kind of touched on. What is going to give you the greatest likelihood of being successful and what are the risks to that success? And let's mitigate those risks in your financial plan. 